14 and 15. Above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. The title of this sermon is The Three Keys to Unity. Three Keys to Unity. My intent, I believe God's intent in this, is that you would promote unity and resolve any conflict you may have in the church. Is that specific enough? (laughs) That you would promote unity and resolve any conflict you may have in the church. And when it comes to the anatomy of the body, the human body, the iliofemoral ligament, iliofemoral ligament, there's going to be a quiz at the end of the sermon. <laughs> it's the strongest ligament in the body. And it attaches the main pelvic bone to that large femur bone of the leg. It's so strong that its tensile strength, where you pull it apart, its tensile strength is more than 772 pounds. That's strong. Now, when it comes to the connection between your leg to your hip, your pelvis, the iliofemoral ligament is crucial, it's the strongest, but it's not alone. There are other ligaments and muscles that also connect the pelvis to the leg. But yet, without this main ligament, scientists say that you would be unable to stand, walk, or even sit properly. In the same way, Christ calls us to three attitudes of the heart. Without these three keys to unity, it is impossible to enjoy unity in the church. Love, peace, and thankfulness. The greatest of these, he says, is love. That's like the iliofemoral ligament. It's the strongest one, but it's not alone, and it can't be alone. Christ will not bless or use a divided church. And so without these three essential elements, this church and any other church will die. So it's serious. There's an urgency. There's a, there's a gravity to this. I ask you, especially you members of Redeemer Bible Church, are you serious about wanting the Lord to use RBC? Do you really want to see this church passed down to the next generation? If you do, if you are, all three of these things, love, peace, and thankfulness, must be Priorities in your life, especially in your relationship with others in the church. All three, as we're going to see, are essential. They must be done by you. They cannot be done to you or for you by God. You must do them. And all three are more than attitudes They're more than states of mind because they show in your actions. And so, again, I intend that and desire that you would promote, that each one of us would take on the task to promote unity and resolve any conflict that you may have in the church. How do we do this? Well, the first essential key to unity is love. Love. Now, we know it's the iliofemoral tendon of these keys. Uh, it's, the most, it's the strongest one. It's the most important one in what he says uh, in 
verse 14. Above all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Paul is saying here that love is the premier quality of Christianity. He says, above all these things, put on love. So more than anything else, more important than putting on a heart of compassion, more important than putting on uh, kindness or putting on humility or gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, more important than all of those things, love one another. That's pretty high up there on the list, isn't there? Isn't it? There's a lot of other really good qualities. We looked at those uh, a couple weeks ago together. These qualities are, are qualities of Christ. And they're precious and dear qualities, especially when the other person has these qualities and you get to experience them. But more important than all of them is love. I mean, after all, love is the first in the list of the fruit of the Spirit, right? In Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit is love. And it goes on, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love is so important that without love, uh, your Christian service... And all the, the uh, Christian niceties and, and, and properness that you put on on a Sunday is nothing. Paul says that in 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Uh, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. And he says, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, that's pretty extreme, right? But if he says, if I don't have love, it profits me nothing. So, Christian, you can say all the right Christian things. You can do all the right Christian things. But if you don't have love, it's empty. It's formality, dear child of God. Love is above all these things because it lasts forever. 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, But now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. It says earlier in chapter 13, love never fails. You see, there will come an end to faith. There will be a day, and oh, we wait for that day, don't we? Where faith will be what? Sight. We won't need faith anymore. Oh, what is that going to be like? But faith is a temporary thing. You're not going to need it in heaven. It will be sight. It will all, be, it will all be in, come to fruition. And hope. I mean, hope is the anchor of the soul, isn't it? It's like your life and your soul is the ship and the anchor of hope is firmly embedded in behind the curtain with God, with Christ in heaven. And as you draw in the anchor, you're, you are drawn to heaven. And there's great stability there with hope. But it's temporary. It's only needed now. But love... There will never be an end to it, Christian. You're, you get to love now, and you will love and be loved for all eternity. It's not a temporary holding place for something better. It is, it's the center jewel, specifically the love of Christ. Your love for him is the centerpiece of your spiritual life. 
And you get to have that. You get to, to grow that and to, and to uh, 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 increase your love. Let it swell up within you. And you get to carry that into heaven with you. You get to bring that love, and then it just, it just, it just more is added in, and more, and more as you see and comprehend the love of God for you, and you respond with pure affection, pure devotion in heaven, without an ounce of sin, and you get to love Him in response. Now, don't you see how important love is? It's greater than all of these. Uh, uh, spiritual qualities of humility and compassion and kindness. It's, it, it, it's at the head of the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, without it, it doesn't matter what we do or say. It, it, it brings validity and life to all the things you say and do as a Christian. And it endures forever. Certainly, love is above all these things, right? And so that's why he says, put on love. Put on love. There are many ideas about what it means to love someone or something, aren't there? Social media, all you have to do is just press the picture twice and you love something, right? Right? Uh, somebody says, well, I love a good ribeye steak. Or maybe it's, you know, you love a boy that you just met and know nothing of. Our world tells us that you can fall in and out of love. And it's very common to substitute true love for physical intimacy, and to equate the two. These are all inadequate definitions and understandings of true love. This love, the word agape in the New Testament, is unmerited and unwavering love. It's hard to define it with another word. So we use itself, we use its own word within its definition. Studying this word, if you study the word agape, you'll find that it was more of a vanilla kind of catch-all term for love. But what the New Testament authors and what God, the Holy Spirit, did is he packed that kind of bland uh, catch-all word for love uh, with a specific um, Uh, Specific qualities. And if we can sum it up in two words, it is unmerited and unwavering. True love is unmerited and unwavering. This is because we see in the New Testament that love has its origin and its source in God. God is love. Love is not God, but God is love. It's a defining quality. It is essential to his nature. It's what he is. It's part of what he is. For us as Christians, love must encompass or involve three things. The mind, emotions, and will. That is everything about you. Your mind, your emotions, and your will ought to be Involved when you say you love someone. Uh, it, it involves your mind. That is, you have to choose and you have to think about it. It involves uh, your emotions. That is, y- it promotes f- fond affection for someone. And it involves the will. That is, it changes how you live and think and act. It changes your decisions and your conduct. It involves a will. 
we are given, even in Colossians, uh, some glimpses of this love. Colossians 1.13 says, uh, Of the Father who rescued us from the authority of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of the Son of His love, or His beloved Son. So this love is a pure love. Because it is the love that is between God the Father and God the Son. Colossians 3.19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. So we see that uh, love it, it shows itself in a conscious effort and choice to forsake bitterness and promote forgiveness and long-suffering. As we learn in the parallel passage to this, in Ephesians 5, it says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So love is sacrificial. It's volitional. It's unmerited. And it's unwavering. If you'll notice, at the beginning of this sentence, we're in verse 14, above all these things put on love. But this is the end of a long sentence. where It began in verse 12. It says, So, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on all these things. One word in there. The beloved of God. We are the beloved of God, dear child of God. Your heavenly Father loves you. And his love for you is unmerited. He didn't earn it. We can't earn it. Even as Christians, we can't earn his love. And so praise God that it is not only unmerited, but it's unwavering. His love for you is unwavering, Christian. Not even your own foolishness and your own waywardness and stubbornness can stop the love of God for you. No trial that you enter, no season of life that is dark blots out the love of God for his child. And so as the beloved of God, we of all people know what it is. To love and be loved, right? We of all people should truly have a good grasp on what God is expecting of us when he says, put on love. You see? Because you've been loved by your heavenly father. You know what it is. You know know exactly what it is. You know exactly what God expects of you in your marriage. Yes, you do. You don't need somebody to give you 10 steps. You just remember God's love for you. Act like that. It's that simple. You remember what it is like to be loved by your heavenly father and by Christ, his son. And you make sure that your wife or your husband feels that way. You know what to do, Christian. And especially in the church, you know exactly what you need to do, dear saint, don't you? You know exactly where you might fall short in fully loving someone in the church. He says, this love is the perfect bond of unity. Love is is the strongest bond of all between any human, but especially in the church body. Love is the highest and chief characteristic to aim for. If we shoot for nothing else, let's shoot for love, dear saints. If you want to leave an impression on your brother or sister in Christ, Aim for love. 
just, I want them to know I love them. Have that mindset. Love is incredibly strong. It's the perfect bond of unity. Uh, Song of Solomon. In chapter 8, it says, Love is as strong as death. Love is as strong as death. Jealousy is as severe as Sheol. Its flashes are flashes of fire, the very flame of Yahweh. Many waters cannot quench love, nor will rivers overflow it. Is your love for your fellow member of the church that strong? where it's going to take a lot for me to stop loving you? Or is it just one time where they forget your name or don't say hi or don't bring you a meal or say the wrong thing or just say the right thing in the wrong way? I think at times our threshold for love is incredibly too low. Is your love as strong as death? Can your love for that fellow believer be unquenchable? Can a river of offense, can a river of disappointment, can a river of distance uh, overflow over that love and that love still stand? Or is it one drop? Of an offense, and that flame of love is just extinguished. That Christian is not how God loves you, is it? How many times have you disappointed Him this week? How many times have you forsaken Him this morning? How many wayward thoughts have you had in the last half hour? You see, you can't quench His love for you. He just keeps coming, keeps coming, keeps coming with his love. He just just loves you with an unconquerable love, Christian. That is how you love one another. You just look past it. You power through the offense. You power through the sin. You power through that quirk or that annoying part about him or her. You just power through it. Get over it. It's not about you. By the way, it's not about you. It's about Christ. It's about his glory. What is your treatment of that person telling about him or about the glory of God? How else will this world know the love of God but by how we treat one another? Oh, look to the love of God for you, Christian. Romans 8 reminds us who will separate us from the love of Christ. Will affliction or turmoil or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? He says, I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the kind of love that you must have for your fellow Christian. It's going to take a lot for you to stop loving them. Oh, we need to have a strong and robust love. We need this because love joins us together in Christ. Love is that chain, that link that connects us all. Notice in Colossians 2, verse 19, speaking about Christ and and the Colossian church, their tendency to uh, forget Christ or neglect him. In Colossians 2, 19, it says, Not holding fast to the head, that is Christ, from whom the entire body, that's us, being supplied and held together by the joints and ligaments 
grows with the growth that is from God. That word ligament is the exact same word, uh, bond of unity in our verse, in in chapter 3, verse 14. It's the exact same. It's just used in a different way. One is used physically as a ligament. The other one is used metaphorically as a bond of unity. But it's the same word. And he says, if you don't have this ligament, this bond of love, you will not grow. Maybe that's why you're stuck in your spiritual state. Maybe that's why you're stagnant. It's because you just can't get yourself to love that person the way you ought. God won't let you grow until you deal with that, Christian. So for your sake, It would be good for you to promote the unity of the body and to deal with any conflict that you might have within the church. For your sake. You want to grow, don't you? Well, you got to deal with this. Now, this is essential for church unity. And again, it must be done by you, not for you or to you. And again, it's more than an attitude. It's more than a state of mind. It must show in how you act. But not only is love essential, so also is peace. Peace. Verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body. Uh, This peace of Christ is uh, tranquility. Uh, I I love the way that uh, some commentators and uh, lexicons describe this. It's described, peace is described as the state of having no need and no fear. Well, that's really vivid, isn't it? It's this state whether it's physical or national or spiritual, of having no need and no fear. That is what peace is. It is a secure satisfaction. A secure satisfaction. And he says it is the peace of Christ. So it's a peace that comes from Christ, of Christ. It's from him that is not of the world. Doesn't this remind us of John 14, 27, where Christ says to his disciples, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives you, I give to you. And he says, Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Peace is a state of having no need and no fear. And this is the peace that you have with God in Christ. Colossians 1.20. Again, Paul has already laid the, the groundwork for this command to have peace with one another. He's already laid, given us a foundation in the first half of the book. For example, Colossians 1.20, where it says, Through him to reconcile... excuse me, all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross, through him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Christian, you were living your life as an enemy of God up until the point where God made peace with you. He reconciled you to himself. How did he do that? How did he uh, restore the relationship? That's which is reconcile. How did he restore the relationship with you? Colossians 1.20, having made peace. So peace comes first and then reconciliation. How did he establish peace? He made peace through the blood of the cross. 
through the sacrifice of his son, he made peace. Christian, often achieving peace with your brother or sister, whether it's in the home or in any other relationship, often to achieve peace in your relationships, you are going to have to sacrifice yourself. You're going to have to die to self first. Because maybe that other person isn't seeking peace. You have to die to self first so that you can humbly go and seek out peace. Maybe that other person isn't wanting to own up to his or her faults. You have to die to self first and own up to your faults first and ask for forgiveness first and then let the Lord work on their heart and not say, okay, your turn, right? But let the Lord work on their heart and pray for them, even praying for them. You have to die to self, don't you? I don't want to pray for that guy. I don't want to pray for her. He's a jerk. Right? You don't know how they treated me. I'm, I'm, I'm praying imprecatory prayers for that person. No. No. The wrath of God has already been spent on his son. There's no more judgment for that person. Not even from you. And so you must die to self and seek peace. He says, you must let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Uh, That word rule is also translated as a judge or an arbiter. It's used uh, for an umpire or a referee in a sport. It's used as an arbiter in a family dispute. Maybe you've had that. Maybe, maybe there, you've had a death in the family, and you know when money gets involved, often, unfortunately, you see the ugly side of people come out, and you need help to navigate through the will and, and, and all of that stuff, and uh, that is an arbiter. What is that person's function? It is to rule, it is to, have it, it is to have the deciding say of what happens. It is to navigate through the disagreements and to bring about a resolution that all parties must submit to. That's what an arbiter is. Again, this, this word is, often, is also used of an umpire or a referee in a sport. So imagine... A sport, whether it's there's football and there's basketball on TV right now. Imagine whatever your favorite sport is, whether it's football or basketball or maybe it's baseball. Imagine these teams competing and there's no referee on the field. I mean, what would that be like? Chaos, right? I mean, yeah, chokeholds wouldn't end so fast. That is the role of peace between you and that other person. It's your arbiter. It's the referee. It's the judge. It's the umpire. It calls the shots. It must rule in your hearts. Without this, you have chaos. And some churches are just stricken with this. I praise God. God has been kind to our church. But it takes work. And if you're not careful, it will just come up. We don't know if there's a church split somewhere in our future. I hope not. We need to guard against that and seek peace so that would never happen. Christian, peace must be the ruler and judge in your heart. That is your emotions... And your opinions must submit to the control of peace. That is the peace of Christ. 
that self-sacrificial peace, that full restorative peace of Christ must be the deciding factor in all your relationships. His peace settles all disputes. So promote unity and resolve conflict that you may have in the church. And let peace govern that. After all, Christ himself says in Matthew 5, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. It's not if you're really good at resolving conflict, then you earn heaven. You earn being adopted as a son of God. That's not what it is. That's not what it's saying. It's saying, blessed are the peacemakers, because those are the sons of God. How do I know if you're a child of God? You, you seek to make peace. And you obey the command of Romans 12, 18. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So again, Romans 12, 8 reminds us that sometimes it's just not possible. But on the other side of this, we come to the conclusion that peace is not possible too soon because he says if possible it might not it could not happen it's possible but uh, as far as it depends on you so often we say it's impossible with that person she's impossible he's impossible and usually the reality is you haven't done all that you could You haven't gone as far as you could. You haven't made it so that so far as it depends on you. I've done everything I can. I've taken the low road. I've I've died to self. I've asked for forgiveness on maybe my response to their sin. Maybe I didn't start it, but I, I didn't help it. I owned up to that. I did everything I could. You need to be able to say that and have a clear conscience, Christian. And he says, you must let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts because this is what you were called to, to which indeed you were called in one body. We are called as the people of God. We are the called ones of God. That's what church means. We are called to peace with God. Imagine... Imagine a king, and he has his kingdom, but he wants to expand that kingdom. He, you know, this is in ancient times, and, and he wants to expand his kingdom uh, and, and rule over more townships and villages and tribes. Now imagine that king going and, and assuming rulership over all of those places, conquering them and and telling them, I rule over you now. Uh, but then all of these townships and villages and tribes, they don't know that the tribe down the street is part of the same kingdom. What would those two tribes and, and townships do? They would go to war, right? That is the opposite of what is the reality in our spiritual life. Christ has conquered you, he's conquered you, he's conquered you. And we all have been conquered and brought under the kingship of Christ. And we all bear the banner of Jesus Christ. And we know about each other, right? And so that means we should not go to war with one another because we're part of the same kingdom. We're part of the same family. Ephesians 2 gets at this. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off, Gentiles, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He made both groups one, that is Gentile and Jew, and broke down the dividing wall of the partition by abolishing in his flesh the enmity, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might create the two, Jew and Gentile, that is, into one new man, making peace.
peace. And for us today, dear church, it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter your temperament. It doesn't matter that other person's attitude or personality or culture or customs. You all have been conquered by the same king. And he has brought all of us under his reign of peace. And so how silly it would It would be for one to fight against the other, for one to wage war with another. We're part of the same kingdom. It doesn't fit. Lastly, he says, and I love this, at the end of verse uh, 15, and be thankful. Now we're going to expand on this a bit more tonight on the quality of thankfulness. But thankfulness is important for church unity, for unity amongst relationships. Gratitude, thankfulness, promotes unity. How do we know that? Because if you think about it, a lack of thankfulness promotes disunity, right? Think about it. What's the opposite of thankfulness? A few things. Ingratitude, obviously. Critic, being critical, a critical spirit. Impatience. And discontent. Discontent. One way to grow in being thankful and to promote unity is by killing these thoughts and attitudes of ingratitude. Killing the thought of and the attitude of being unthankful for a, the blessing of a local church. Maybe it's not what you wish it would be, but it's yours. So be thankful. And especially one that is committed to the word and obeying God and making disciples. Be thankful that the essentials are there. Maybe there's a ministry or there's an aspect that you just can't get over that maybe we're missing. Be thankful for what you do have. Amen. Kill the attitude and, and, and the thoughts of being critical. Critical of decisions that are made. Methodologies that are employed. Or people that aren't what you would prefer them to be. Right? Nobody is just quite as good as you. Just, you know, if there, was more of, if there was more of me, man, we would have perfect unity. And God could really use this church. Like, that, that is not the right attitude. You need that other person with all of their faults and failures. And they need you. So kill those thoughts of a critical spirit. Always looking at the faults and the wrongs and the lack. Also, kill the attitude and thoughts of impatience. That is being impatient with people who are not changing the way that you would want them to change. Or not growing as quickly as you would like them to grow. You know, I can see growth in certain people, but man, if, if they would just do this or if they would really be serious, they could really grow. Well, just be thankful for the growth that is there. That means that there's spiritual life. That means God's not done. And there's hope. Don't be impatient. Fight and kill the attitude and thoughts of discontentment. For example, being discontent with the good things that are present. The ministries that we do have. uh, The the servants that we do have. The the curriculum that we do have. The uh, fill in the blank. The saints that are here. Be content with that. Now I'm thankful 
that in this season of our church, and it's been this way for a while, but I'm thankful that in this church, you know, our, our facilities is nothing to uh, shake a stick at, you could say. Our facility, I mean, God has graciously given us this property, and He has gracious, graciously stewarded us with uh, this wonderful place. The fact that we have four walls and the lights turn on is a blessing. Like a lot of Christians around the world don't have that. But in comparison to some other churches, maybe down the road or across town, we don't quite look like that, do we? I am thankful for that in some measure because that means, for the most part, you're here for the right reason. <laughs> The lights and the show and the fog machine didn't draw you because we don't have that stuff. <laughs> the performance and, and the, you know, the rock stars of the band uh, and the eloquent speaker didn't draw you because we don't have that stuff. I trust that you're here for the word of God. You're here because you have heard the shepherd's voice and you just want to follow him. So be content with that. You know, unthankfulness will unravel a church. But thankfulness is a strong bond. Instead of these attitudes, we are commanded to be thankful. It is a decision to have thoughts of gratitude dominate your mind. You see, thankfulness is an attitude of the heart and mind that is the right response to the kindness and grace of God. That's a long definition. It is an attitude of the heart and mind that is the right response to the kindness and grace of God. It is, to say it briefly, it is the right response to grace. That is thankfulness. The right response to grace. So as we close, let us reflect on what grace have you received that you can respond to with thanksgiving? What grace is of God in our church, in your life, in the life of others, can you respond with thankfulness to? Well, again, Paul has already laid the groundwork in the first half of this book. Colossians 1. Verse 3 through 6, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Since we heard of your faith, so faith, faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, so faith and love. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, hope, faith, love, and hope. There's that triad again. Of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel. We have the gospel. Let us be thankful for that which has come to you just as in all the world. Also, it is constantly bearing fruit. God is bearing fruit in our midst. Let's thank God for that. It's multiplying just as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard and understood the grace of God in truth. There it is. You give thanks because it's the right response to the grace of God. Colossians 1.12, give thanks, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Christian, you have much to be thankful for because you, when you were once unqualified to be a part of the family of God, now you are qualified because you're in Christ. Now, by the grace of God and nothing else, there is A sense where we can say, I ought to inherit heaven. And the ought is not because of you. It's because I am in Christ. And only by that connection, only by his grace, now it is because I am adopted as a child of God, now it is right and fitting for me to inherit the blessings of heaven. Oh, how bold a statement that is. Have you thought about that? Be thankful that you have been made qualified for heaven. And then Colossians 2, 6 and 7, Therefore, as you received Christ, 
As you receive Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. How, having been firmly rooted and, and then having been and being built up in him and having been established in your faith and then abounding in thanksgiving. So the point is, because you have received Christ, that means you have something to abound in thanksgiving about. What am I thankful for? Well, I get Christ. I've received Christ. Christian, you get Christ. He's yours. And nobody can take him away from you. Not even you. Thankfulness is essential for church unity. And it must be done by you. You must choose to be thankful. And it must show up, not in a state of mind or an attitude only, but it must show up in your actions. So maybe you should tell that brother or sister, you know what, I see, I don't see much in you. You don't have to say that. (laughs) I don't see much of you, but I do see this. Right? So you just come to them and say, you know what, I'm thankful for you because I see this. You're, You're just there. I, I, I show up on Sunday, and I, can, I know I'm going to see you. And if you're not here, then I know something's wrong. And I'm just thankful for that example. Maybe it's just that. Or whatever it might be. Look for things to be thankful for. And that will promote church unity. So, dear church, I ask you again. Are you serious about wanting the Lord to use RBC? Do you want to see this church passed down to the next generation? Then all three of these, love, peace, and thankfulness, must be uh, central in your efforts as you relate and interact with one another in the church. Promote unity. And if you need to, resolve any conflict you may have in the church. And may Christ get the glory. Dear church, if I can be pastoral, I trust I've been pastoral up to this point, but if I can be very personal, we don't know what the Lord has for us in the next year. We could be in another wonderful facility, or the lights could be shut off. And the windows shuttered. We're right there. We don't know. And so the question is, how serious are you about passing this church on to the next generation? And I trust that that would show your seriousness and commitment to the next generation and to the glory of Christ would show through in how you relate to your brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let's pray. Stand with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, O Lord, give us a heart that reflects and is very familiar with your love for us, what you've done to establish peace with us, And our response to all of your grace uh, as a heart of thanksgiving, may we uh, first work on that in our primary relationship with you. And I pray, Lord, that that would spill out into our other relationships, beginning in the home and then next into the church. I pray, Lord, that people would look into uh, our relationships and see us even the way that we talk after a service, that we go across the aisle, that we don't just hang out with our familiar friends or our family. Lord, help us to go across those barriers and to fight for unity. Lord, we have so much in common. Lord, help us to forget ourselves, to have victory over our flesh. Give us strength and endurance, Lord. It's it's not easy. But Lord, I pray that Christ would be exalted in our midst. 
both today and in the years and even decades to come. Oh, Lord, do your amazing work. May you get all the praise and all the credit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing.